Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're listening to. I am Paris Chong, the gallery director of the beautiful Leica Gallery Los Angeles, located in West Hollywood. Um, thank you for joining us. We always appreciate your presence at our talks. This is Leica Conversations in conjunction with Photoville. Uh, today, we're talking to the beautiful and talented Deborah Anderson. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, amongst her many achievements over her 18-year photo career, she is a documentary filmmaker and has released three fine art books to date. Her earlier work has been compared to that of Helmut Newton, not too shabby, uh, by the LA Times, and she has graced the covers of countless albums and magazines for the likes of Pink, Cindy Crawford, George Clooney, you name it. Her latest venture, Women of the White Buffalo, is due to be released in early 2021 with an eclectic list of producers that she's going to tell us all about. It has already won seven awards, including Best Documentary Accolade at the 24th Red Nation Film Festival and Best Director of a Feature Documentary at the Los Angeles Independent Film Festival. Without further ado, I would love to introduce you to my dear friend and amazing, talented woman, Deborah Anderson. <laughs> Hello. I love how technically challenged we are. <laughs> I'm funny for Deborah and I, like is so technically pro prolific. And so Deborah and I are kind of old school 80s girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. I'm like, ah. Yeah, she is. Well, Deborah Anderson, well, welcome. How are you? How are you feeling today? All is well. Thank you so much, Paris. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you for bringing me in. Thank you for, for allowing me to be here and to uh, really to be a part of the, I believe it's the ninth annual Photoville Festival. It's such an honor, honestly, to speak about uh, the current projects that I'm working on and to have people come in and be a part of the community. So hopefully we can inspire them with our stories and uh, excite them with uh, the new film that's complete and ready to get out into the world. So now the topic today is culture and identity. So uh, why is it important to share stories that speak to a people's culture? Mm, I know it's, you know, it's everyone sort of asked me, how did I go from shooting pop icons like you've mentioned, Elton John to Pink to many other wonderful people. And I, I really enjoyed that journey to uh, stepping into a whole different world, a world that I actually knew nothing about. Uh, except for sort of some uh, preconceived idea, you know, really, if anything, a romanticized idea of, of the Native American Indians, their culture, their way, their ceremony. So um, it was funny, my father actually gifted me a book and it was by Edward Curtis. And it was just before I jumped into this project and I called him, I said, did you know that I was working on this Native idea that I possibly might want to go and make a film and take photos and he was like no but I felt like you needed this book so since I started the project I started to really work on uh the inspiration behind these images why would my gaze be different or why would it be unique or how does it become something that people haven't seen and how do I speak to the modern day native American Indian so I started to look at a lot of different photographs you know basically looking at Edward Edward Curtis's work along with Frank Reinhardt, most of the portraits that you see from the turn of the century, the beginning of the 19th century, were the, the most famous ones really were, were captured by them. And I realized that they had this way of really uh, connecting to the soul of these people. Uh, the, the, just the photography is so unique and so beautiful. And so from that, I started to decide on sort of how would I shift the, a modern gaze and yet make it timeless because I felt like these pictures obviously felt antiquated and they felt old. So how do I capture these people in their, uh, in their present day uh, way and still get to tell the story of their past and their ancestral history and their ceremony? So um, it was a real joy to finally get to sit in front of them, having had this knowledge and recognizing one of the big stories I'd, I found out was that, you know, Edward Curtis and uh, Frank, Reinhardt both were taking these photos of the natives because they believed that they were a dying race. They believed that they would be no longer. So they wanted to capture the essence because they realized how powerful these peoples were. However, it was under the guise that they would be no longer. And so for me to be able to step into that world now and they're very much alive and well and 
still doing their ceremony and still have that connection to who they really are, it was such a privilege because I, my agenda wasn't, oh, they're a dying race. My agenda, if I had an agenda, was to capture their spirit now and uh, to bring that to, to an audience that hopefully would have a, a new appreciation and also a remembering of these peoples. So I don't know if that quite answered your question, but it was. No, I know it did, absolutely. Now, now, with Women of the White Buffalo, we're really getting a bird's eye view into the culture of these Native American Indians in South Dakota. Can you specify what your biggest takeaway was from the Lakota tribe? Of course. You know, when you walk into a culture and you get to learn about them, their ideas, their um, everything from social behavior to ceremony, to prayer, to, to witness that type of um, uh, reality, you're, it's, it's so incredibly humbling. I was deeply moved that they trusted in me to allow me to come as a photographer, as a filmmaker, obviously of indigenous descent. Uh, my grandfather and I, I grew up on the islands, but my grandfather's from the islands in the Caribbean. So I'm, I'm used to, a, you know, the culture of the Caribbean with the, the native understanding there. However, they've been so assimilated. There really isn't a language uh, in the Caribbean. So, you know, thinking about the uh, takeover of the British Empire coming in and, as we know, a lot of the European countries sort of raping and pillaging the, the coast of the Caribbean. They've forgotten the essence of who they are as tribes. So going in with the Lakota people, they still have this very, very strong identity. They still have this very, very deep culture. So it was a privilege to really sit with them and be gifted, really to be gifted their stories. Um, and then try and parlay that into a series of photography um, pieces, which we've shown at the Leica Gallery in Los Angeles, Boston and New York. Um, as well as putting a film together. So it was it was a massive privilege. Yeah, and the pictures are so gorgeous as we'll all see here soon. Now, what led you to shift your gaze from shooting the pop icons you mentioned and fashion brands to wanting to document such uh, humanitarian work and the Lakota women? You know, like, I, how did you I, from that? It's, it's, it's an interesting one. You know, I think we're barraged every day. There's this... Uh, constant flow of, of imagery on your social media. People are posting pictures and in between people posting their meals or their, uh, what they did today or their outfit, right? Which is good and fine. We also see what's happening on this planet. We, we, we see images of war. We see images of, uh, you know, women uprising against the system. We have obviously now what's happening with COVID and all these different, uh, things that we are privy to on a daily basis that we never used to be privy to because everybody seems to have an iPhone, so everybody's a photographer. So um, all of this is coexisting with one another. And I kept thinking, how do I speak to something that would help shift people's consciousness about it? And I know that you and I had spoken prior to my going to South Dakota as like a gallery yourself had asked if I would do a show with you. And that was really the impetus to this whole unraveling of my ending up on the, on the Pine Ridge Reservation was you asked me to do a show and I really, you know, we, 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 we joked around about ideas, but really for me, it was how do I speak to something greater than myself at this time in my career? I've been shooting at that point for, you know, 16 years and just felt like it was important to, 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 to say something that would really shift people's understanding of how we walk on this planet. That's how I kept feeling about it. And so it came in the form of, of a dream. It was a meditation. It was um, almost like a download. I, I'm always careful with the way that I express uh, that piece. And it just flowed so effortlessly. I spoke, I got introduced to an elder on the Lakota uh, nation uh, tribe that very renowned for the work that she does for the peoples, Carol Einrup Herrera. And once I spoke with her after about 20 minutes of me giving her my bio, when I've taken photos of this and I, she was like, that's great. So when are you coming? And I was like, uh, uh, well, I just have to raise the money, but I'm coming. And she's like, we've been waiting for you. And that was well, the beginning of the rest of the, the journey, really. 
you're you're actually the perfect person to do this because you're such a spiritual and um and, and healing person like i can't think of anyone better to tell this story and um, anybody that knows you well knows how you know you how shamanistic you are and how you are such a healer and such a storyteller so you were the perfect person i just needed to throw that in there because you are the perfect person to thank tell the story. you now, um, may I ask you what your greatest challenges in creating this body of work were? I think it was more than anything was just getting out of my own way. <laughs> you know, you yeah. go in with it, you know, you, it's the big one. It's the big one. It's like, you think you know everything you get there and you know nothing. You know, it was, I was humbled so many times and it was the challenge, if anything, was just trusting that I was capable of holding the space in the right way. Because with all the years of working with lighting and all the years of, of working with, with um, brands and, you know, 30 people on set, or maybe not, five people on set, and having this sort of great big team and a lot of other people making decisions for you at the same time, now you're just down to the four of you, my, me and my crew of, of four other people. And you have to still bring a, a, a level of competence to that table. And it felt like all the work that I'd done prior to this, learning light, understanding light, understanding composition, allowed me to step into this where I, we didn't bring lights, everything was natural light, everything I shot, so it was very unfussy, because I realized that I only had one chance to get it right. And the, the, the gift of, of being able to jump into your toolbox after many years of fine tuning your ability as a photographer um, was what was my greatest challenge. It's like, it's okay, go in, go in, you know, you know it, you know it, you know. Um, <laughs> but it was, yeah, that it wasn't the people, it wasn't trying to meet people, it wasn't being allowed in. I was, I was gifted uh, the, the welcome by the elder Carol Ironrope Herrera, so then she was the one who, who introduced me to all the other women that ended up sitting in front of my lens and they're in the film. Well, you know, that, I was gonna ask you that as well. Like, was it hard getting in with, with, with that tribe? Because I know some people can be guarded, you know, and, and it seems like they really just welcomed you in there with open arms. But I know that maybe that's not the easiest thing to do, but you kind of look like you fit in anywhere. So maybe that was easier, you know? I, I think having indigenous, blood having the indigenous background of course and being a woman yeah it was, I it was like maybe a a, a a man it might not have been as easy to tell the story well, I don't they've know had, why. you know they, they've had that they've had many people show up men show up mm. white white skin you know not quite the same um uh story as they've had with their ancestral stories let's say so for me, it was, they were asking me which tribe I was from. And then of course I opened my mouth and they're like, oh, wait, you're English? And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm like this much um, British in me. It, it just, I, I, you know, you show up with these situations with your heart. It wasn't a given that it was gonna be easy. It wasn't easy. When you sit with some of the most heartbreaking stories and you, have to hold that in a way and then parlay it to an audience because i had it in my mind the whole time you know i'm sitting in front of some of the most beautiful beautiful people and i'm asking them to tell me about their lives and they're telling me some of the hardest stories for me as an observer to hold and hear and then i knew i had to take a portrait and you're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place where you're just like it feels so invasive yet i realized that it was so important that people hear these stories. And with them accepting me in such a speedy amount of time really was because of Carol, uh, Carol's ability to hold me when she introduced me to the people. So the tribe were very open to um, having me uh, be welcomed as family, really as family. She, she gave me a, a ring about two days after I had arrived. She said, you're my sister. And I, I didn't know the custom or the way that, you know, you, you exchange a piece of jewelry and there's a little ceremony around it and, you know, not to, to go deep into that, but she immediately brought me in because she recognized we don't have much time. She recognized that she didn't have much time. She passed away um, oh, no. a year ago. 
Oh, so that's... she watched the final. She she held my hand for the for the year and a half of my making of this project, and then when she saw the final edit of the film, she died. Now this is a gorgeous picture that we're looking at mm -hmm. right here. The girl is just stunning. Now, was it easy to get the natives to stand in front of the camera for you? Um, it's an interesting one because there's the saying that the natives won't pose for you because they believe that the camera will take their soul away. And I was speaking to um, a friend about this, one of my native uh, women from the film, Sunrose Ironshell, and she felt that it was more of a Hopi belief because they, were way more, they are way more of a superstitious nation. And she said that it was something to do with the idea that when foreigners would come and capture their sacred ceremonies, that it would take a little bit of, of the magic. And I shouldn't even really use that word, but the, the essence, the, the power within their ceremonies, it would take a little bit of it away. So um, at first it was a little, I, it was really me that was embarrassed or I just felt <laughs> You know, I think I was like a deer in headlights most of the time. Like this one of Delacina Chief Eagle. I've taken a lot of photos of her. She is also in the film. The most beautiful spirit, the most beautiful woman. And when I photographed her, she would change, shapeshift into a man, into a woman, into a man. It was like I was seeing her ancestral lineage wow. coming through the lens. It was incredible. To, and even she said it when she saw the pictures after she went, wait, I look like a boy here. I, wait, I look like a, a grandma here. I look, it was just, it, it's, you're capturing a history that is unlike anything that I know I have ever experienced. And um, to see them dance, to see them in their regalia, to see them in ceremony and to, to be given the opportunity to, to capture any of it is, um, is a gift for me anyways, as, a, as an artist, as a filmmaker, um, and these beautiful backdrops of South Dakota um, just added to uh, the, the, the essence of what I was trying to, to show people with the images, you know, once I was done with the images. I know it's, it's, it's so important what you're doing to tell these stories of the Native American Indian. It's just so beautiful. And we didn't really talk a lot about um, a, part, a lot about the documentaries about how these beautiful women are being kidnapped and sex trafficked and disappearing and there's not, not a lot of not a lot of help and support for these people which is awful yeah you know i feel like people have asked me you know are you an artist or are you an activist and i feel like it's my duty and responsibility as an artist to share these stories you know stories that might be uncomfortable um, that are not exactly on people's radar uh, I just feel that as an artist, there's an opportunity to support stories that need to be shared. Mm -hmm. And when I first Googled Native American Indian woman, when you, know, when you had first asked me to do the show at the Leica Gallery in Los Angeles, and that was what came through is I, I really want to do a series around or something around the Native American Indian women. I, what came back at me was they're going missing, they're being murdered. They are um, being sexually abused, raped, and sex trafficked. But n numbers that they don't even tally because nobody cares enough about the Native American Indian women. And you're going, what? So in that moment, I was like, it's not just a series of photographs. It's like, I want to be able to parlay the experience of being with them and hearing their stories and still show some beauty because they are so powerful and so beautiful. And at the same time, bring the awareness that actually they're suffering and actually the genocide of these peoples is continuing and actually they don't have a voice. And that's really where that photo with the, the red handprint, which I think is somewhere in the, in the, uh, the doc of photos that we're gonna show during the presentation, that's how that came to light. Cause I Googled that image, you know, I put handprint on native woman's mouth, didn't find it anywhere. I found one image of a native woman with a lot of makeup with like red across her eyes and a black handprint. And that was the only image I could find of a native woman with, with a handprint on her mouth. So I said to Delacina, I, I keep seeing this image. I keep seeing this image. I can't find the image, which means I think we're meant to make this image. So we did three images. We did the, the handprint on the mouth. 
we did the, the red blood tear. We did a red handprint on the back of Delacina's uh, shoulder. And the three were as, as sort of presented together, which we presented at the show. And the idea was, you know, silence no more and no more mm -hmm. oppression, suppression of the people and uh, that we will no longer bleed for our country, that which is theirs innately. The, uh, the great continents of, of America, as we say, North America, South America, um, was all one continent. So we put that image out on uh, Facebook and it went viral within the native communities. And I started getting these text messages saying, oh, that image with that red handprint. And that was, I, I put that up on social media over just over two years ago. And since then, I'm sure we're all very well aware, that idea of, of bringing that to the forefront, that consciousness, the red handprint has, you know, all the natives are doing it, you know, really raising awareness, which not, you know, I just, it's like, I want to be clear that it's not that it was like, oh, I started something, but I believe I was the, the, the beginning of a greater bridge to sort of bridge that gap between the natives speaking about what they're going through and nobody listening and the natives speaking and now people taking note. New York Times speaking about it. A lot of the big newspapers finally speaking about the murder missing indigenous women, hashtag MMIW, which was started in Canada um, because nobody was tallying these numbers. So it's becoming more in the consciousness of the people. And I'm just, all I can say is I'm grateful to be a part of it. And, uh, and it's, it's so powerful what you're doing. Again, some people are asking what the uh, documentary is, Women of the White Buffalo. We're talking to Deborah Anderson, who's made uh, this documentary, and it will be out pretty soon to watch. Now, storytelling is such a big part of why Leica is so popular, because we've been telling stories through the lens and photography for, oh, you know, 100 years. Mm -hmm. And storytelling so much of what you do. Um, and so it's such a huge part of your work. And why does that, that feel important to you? Well, you know, it's interesting. We talk about when, again, you brought me into the Leica family. Um, I believe it was after Julian Lennon had his show and he introduced us uh, together. Um, and then that was it. That was the end of it. That was the end of everything. He was worried. I was worried, but you know, we made it. Um, to be creative in this way, was really um, exciting because I recognize that uh, Leica really has been behind the storytelling idea uh, through photography. And of course, like Henri Cartier-Bresson is like one of my favorite when I was living in Paris. My dad, again, my dad, he's always, he's always, he sort of shows up at the right time. He's like, oh, I, you're doing photography here. Take this book. Um, and it was, you know, wonderful to to see how you can just be an observer and, and capture those moments. And I haven't really studied that. That has never been my photography. That was never really the, the I guess, the course that I was taking. I, I light, I, you know, pose, I create, I'm, you know, more of a visual in that way. So with having the, the opportunity with Leica, it just, it was all hand in hand that it's like, oh, I can tell a story and speak to these stories that, like I have never spoken to. So I, I'm gifting a whole new uh, visual uh, playground um, and being able to speak to something that I think is so timely. You know, we're so used to seeing images of days gone by. And so to be able to bring something that is current about a subject that like I haven't yet uh, really just had the opportunity with their photographers to, to you know, tell this story and being an indigenous woman it just, the whole thing just felt um, like the perfect synergy. And I knew that of all the platforms to have an opportunity to speak to, um, Leica was the perfect fit. So it's all about timing as well, because I don't think I was ready to hold this type of work, um, you know, four or five years ago. And it just took, you have to shift into how you hold these spaces. It's not, oh, I can take great pictures. I'm gonna run off to the natives. It's like, I just know that I have a tool to share stories and I want to, um, I want to do it the right way. And now I'm ready to do that. And Leica yeah. were a big part of that, you know, shift in my journey, which is great. Well, the Leica is proud to be able to offer the platform for more diversity and for more women's voices. And, we, you know, we have the Leica Women Photo Project and we really are trying 
with the rest of the world to open these, these doors that need to be open and, and uh, tell the stories that need to be told. Now, since we're talking about Leica, um, why don't you tell us what camera you use? <laughs> it's like, I think I'm the most, um, you know, anyone that asks me, I think back in the day, I mean, I'm just being totally honest because I want to, I want to share with anyone who's an up and coming photographer that it's okay if you're not technical, it's okay. I'm, I'm not and have never really been a technical gal. When uh, this opportunity came, Leica offered me the Leica SL camera, the first of the series. And because of my timeline of me trying to get to South Dakota, the camera was picked up by a producer and it was brought to me in South Dakota and it was handed to me with two amazing lenses. I think one of them was a, a 24 to um, 90. See, and this is the best bit. One made people closer and one was further away. And my assistant was like, don't ever say that again. And I was like, okay, because you've been doing this for way too long. And I'm just like, I just can't get into the small stuff. I'm just, I just, you know, it's all about my lighting. However, I taught myself to you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, like at this point, I've just like dropped the mic. They're like, okay. <laughs> But the beauty with, with working with the Leica camera was it was so user-friendly. So, you know, I guess I'm trying to give you a little bit of history that I didn't know the camera, this one specific. I, I have, I'd been playing with and I have, I do own a, a sort of more point and shoot Leica, but to have this type of a machine, it was, it was intimidating. And I knew I had two days to figure it out because we were basically starting our shoot. And it was, it was so easy. It's the, the, the whole, First, it's such a slick and beautifully uh, designed uh, piece of apparatus that it, it, it's as Im intimidating as it feels. Actually, there's only four buttons, so you can't really go wrong, you know? It's like if you just get to, to understand what to do. Um, so within, yeah, within two days, I pretty much knew how to use the camera. And, um, you know, I remember years ago when I first started, I had a very inexpensive camera. And I remember I, I'd done this, a couple of series with this camera and this man who was helping me do all the development, he was like, please get a better camera. And I'm like, oh no, no, uh -huh. but I take great pictures with this camera. He's like, no, 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 you really need to get a better camera. And I'm like, yeah, but this camera, anyways, my equipment got stolen. He was like, so grateful. It got stolen on a shoot that we did. And I cried for days because I believe my camera was why I was good at what I did. And so, moving out of that and, and sort of moving into other cameras, won't mention anything else because finally I arrived with Leica, which I'd always wanted to be a Leica girl. And you realize that you're being gifted an opportunity to use um, a piece of equipment that really can see beyond that which you can see in front of you um, and give you a lot more control and sort of mastery over uh, the, the, whatever your subject is that you're trying to shoot. So. It was a, a great uh, joy <laughs> to receive it. Of course, I was like, okay, of course, now I need to buy one. <laughs> and I'm fully, I sold all my equipment and I'm now a total like a family member. <laughs> the way that's how we roll here. Like it's, it's, it's like a family and a cult and a club and all kinds of wonderful things. But um, well, you've been so supportive. I mean, I think like a right from the beginning of this journey, couldn't do enough. It was very much like how, what do you need? You know, especially when you don't know the range of, of, of uh, apparatus and what you can achieve with it. And you had, you know, anyone and any, everyone be in touch with me depending on what I needed. And then of course, when I started to show the results and because we were blowing these photos into these huge uh, life-sized uh, framed pieces, I, I was, I just felt supported the whole way. And that's um, a really big part of my being able to do this work was feeling that kind of support, especially with a subject like this. I just, I didn't, it's like, I felt like I had one chance to get it right. And um, well, I mean, it, it, you, you got it so right. But the, pre the previous photo we had on before Deborah was talking about the hand over the woman's mouth. Now that's probably yeah. this one. Thank you. you. That's probably your number one seller at the moment, I, which made me wonder if we made the addition big enough. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, maybe we may change that addition number. But um, this, <laughs> well, this picture has been selling very well and um, people love this photo. Um, yes, it tells it tells a thousand things. Somebody said, you know, how did I get that look in her eye? 
that there's something that she's, you know, parlaying to. And I said to her, to Delacina Chief Eagle, you are all the stories that came before you. And she just changed. It was like this moment and I was crying and she was, you know, tearing up. I was like, oh my God, this is, it was really deep. It was very deep. And I do want to also add that all the sales thus far from any of the selling of any prints that we've been displaying uh, at these galleries, the money has gone back to uh, the continuum of the making of the film because the whole film project, even showing in the galleries and any costs uh, you know, connected to it have all been donated, financially supported via donations um, through the 503 Coach to Edify Foundation. So it's been supported by the people because in my heart, you know, it's really for the people, this whole entire project. That's Carol Einrope Herrera, oh. who is the, the woman, the elder that brought me in at the beginning. And uh, I felt so blessed. This photo is now on her gravestone. Oh, such a blessing to be connected to her for really forever. It's just, this is like a life changing experience that, you know, I realize not everybody gets an opportunity like this. I recognize that to step into a world that it's not, I'm not Lakota. A lot of the natives were like, well, why you? And I'm like, well, I'm indigenous and I have Indian blood. I'm just not of the Lakota tribes or of an American tribe. It is part of my history. My ancestors also uh, were very much a part of the genocide and the um, alcoholism and uh, you know all sorts of different types of slavery. You know, I have a lot of African blood as well. And really my part in this is to share stories of peoples that are still struggling in some format and have other people be aware of the people here in America the people that are around you, surrounding you, might just need your support. And just to open up our uh, uh, vision, because I think we're so cornered into, you know, our government and now, of course, COVID, and we're forgetting all this other part of, of the story, the whole story, which is really the innate, what I, I keep coming back to, you know, my, my gut feeling is that um, we have forgotten who we are. And when I speak to the, the native understanding, they continue to support their ancient wisdom and pass that down to their children. And they continue to uh, speak in their language and they still have their ceremony. And we as the outsiders have no idea of the importance of, of, of capturing uh, really the energy of all of this in our hearts to remember the part of us that we have forgotten in who we are as indigenous peoples. We're all indigenous to some land at some point. Um, and this, this really called me as an opportunity to have people want to get involved rather than be in their I, 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 me, me, me concept of life um, and sort of take a look around them and see which tribe actually lives near you whose whose land are you actually on like doing a little bit of history do they need support how can i support them just to open up that that feeling of community um and that's what the gift of being a an artist or a photographer is that you can do that you wake people up with the with the work that you do mm -hmm. now so we were talking about being uh you know having african blood in and uh, now do you find that being a woman of color has helped or hindered you in your career I remember I did a, um, a master class in New York a couple of years back now. And the, the, the audience was mainly young women of uh, mixed blood, black women, mixed race women, uh, all sorts of, all sorts of uh, different uh, skin color. And I, the bottom line is, is that I've never looked at myself as being black. I've never looked at myself as being a woman of color where I put myself in a specific box that then has me believe that I'm only able to do this because I am this. I've always walked with all the things that I've ever chosen to do in my life. I've always walked with that feeling of like, well, I want to do it. So let's try and do it rather than, oh, well, I'm a woman. So that's going to, oh, I'm a woman of color. So that's going to, and maybe that's a, a massive privilege to have not had that 
in my growing up where I've, I've had to look at my color as a good or bad thing. Um, my mother's black, my father is white. I, I never chose either as a, as a, you know, what would I prefer to be? It was like, I am both and I'm all things. And so it was interesting because when I did this talk, a couple of the young girls at the end, you know, with their questions, um, there's about 200 young women. They, um, they said, how did you do it? And I was like, D did what? They said, how did you make it? How did you become a photographer shooting these world renowned people as a black woman? And I swear to God, I know, I, you know, some people will probably be horrified, <laughs> but I look behind me. I was like, wait, you took about me? I said, but I've never, that's, I've never walked into a room with a, attachment to this. What mm -hmm. I'm attached to is my passion. And what I'm attached to is uh, the stories I want to tell or the experiences I want to have. Um, my attachment is to um, broadening my everyday adventure, you know, not oh, I'm this, so I can't be that. So that my advice was to walk in with that knowing that you're worth it and to have that confidence and to break through those barriers. And if you feel that there's a tension because of your race, your color, your, your creed, your belief, religion, it's time we stepped way beyond that. That is what is killing our planet. You know, we speak to all the things that we've been privy to now and you know a lot of people speaking about the racism you know oh there's so much racism now I'm like racism has always been there nothing's changed it's just that we now get to see it because of yeah. what I spoke about you know people taking photographs um you know while something's happening with whether it's police or this or that you know people have a camera and it's been captured so I keep saying, let's speak to the story we really want to be telling. And that is a story of unity. And that is a story of waking up and remembering who we are. And that is a story of uniting different cultures, different identities, recognizing all of them for who they are, you know, because that is important too. But then bringing us together as a collective and holding that space. Because if we continue the way we're continuing, we're doomed. You know, I keep speaking about the idea that, you know, if we uh, no longer support and take care of our indigenous peoples, we don't stand a chance of survival. And so I speak to, you know, as I, I've done a few of these uh, um, presentations, speaking to other photographers, what story are you telling? What is it that you want people to see? will your gaze, which is always going to be unique and always be beautiful and always be, you know, profoundly you, what is it that you're capturing that will, will change the hearts of people? Or will you wake people up with your art? Like we are not in a place anymore that we can mindlessly just, you know, create pictures for the sake of creating pictures. If we have that gift. I believe it's my responsibility as an artist to speak to stories that will shift people's understanding of who they are through the stories of other people. And so I, you know, I really am, I, you know, I've, I've spoken so much to young uh, filmmakers and young photographers who are excited about how do I get into the business? Well, find, 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 uh, find your viewpoint and then find your story. And it'll always be unique because we're all, you know, we're all unique at the end of the day. Um, and there are many stories to tell. And there's something else I was just reading about, you know, a lot of photography of the wild, especially when we think about the Wild West at the turn of the century, America was still somewhat untamed. They didn't have all the fences, stopping people from going into places, you know, sort of, you know, you can only eat here in this little picnic area and you can only sort of, you know, park your caravan here. Everything was open and it was still very much an untamed place. Wild animals, we looked at that's a hundred years ago. We looked to that same landscape now, and it is not the same. Mm -hmm. The stories that we, we are going to speak to, if we're going to speak to anything that's happening on this planet, is really about destruction. So, how do we heal a planet through the work as a creative with all that's going on right now? How do we speak to these stories? And I think one of the big pieces to uplift, uplift. The audience, you know, this beautiful picture here of this Lakota woman, you know, she was very apprehensive about having her photo taken. She was concerned about her weight. 
a very mm. normal human thing, right? Not because she's Lakota, she must be, must be seen a certain way. She was just, in, she wasn't sure, you know, or will I come across, it was so sweet. And I'm like, we're all the same. You know, we all, we all, we all have our insecurities, but when it comes to culture and identity, of course, we all have a very unique stance. But as, as that sort of, you know, that, that humanness, we're all very much suffering the same way, in joy the same way, in happiness the same way, and a lot of sadness in the same way. So really as, as, a, as a, an artist, as a photographer, as a filmmaker, I'm deeply in gratitude, you know, and deeply humbled at the opportunity to speak to something that not many people speak to. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think it's a, a good time. Someone said the other day, said, oh, the timing of your film is so perfect. It is. But I said, well, of course it is because it wasn't my idea. I surrendered, you know, I asked you as we were talking, like, what am I going to do, want to do? And then you start listening and then you just start getting these sort of like, oh, well, you see something that triggers something else. And it was almost, um, I'm going to say it, it was like a calling. I'd worked all these years as someone else, a really good friend of mine said, it's like you've worked all these years to do what you're doing right now. I think so. Now, um, I mean, and it, like I said earlier, you're the perfect person to, to get the story out there. So now I want to talk a little bit about your amazing documentary, Women of the White Buffalo. Um, the film is coming out next year, 2021, January-ish. Hopefully, we, yes. hopefully, and we, I know you have a really eclectic group of producers. Can I ask a little bit about that? Yes. Um, it's, it took about a year and a half to make the film. Obviously because of COVID, everything kind of, I had to put the brakes on, which I think the world put the brakes on. So, I mean, you know, could oh. we even begin? However, nothing changed with the circumstances of the people. And I actually went back to South Dakota about three months ago now, because I, I, yeah, three months ago. And I did a little bit of interviewing video, which I'm gonna be putting out over the next uh, month or two, speaking to COVID and how it's affected the women on the reservation and the men on the reservation and the children and the elders. Because as we know, the Navajo reservation had the worst amount of cases and they were up to like 4,000 cases and mm. hundreds of their elders were dying and medicine peoples and Pine Ridge and the people I know, the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota uh, nations were fully aware that if it spread amongst them, they wouldn't stand a chance because they, their infrastructure is, is so messed up. So um, ultimately the film is, is really a testament to the strength of these women and the power of their stories, I believe, really hit home because it could parlay to so much of our own experiences when it comes to alcoholism or drug addiction. Uh, you know, the murdered and missing indigenous women piece is heartbreaking and harrowing. And oh. to go back and to, to, to hear of someone that you knew died. And I think the first two months that I was there, and this was now two years ago, I witnessed people that I knew, knew somebody that passed. During the two months, 19 people died on the reservation. They have the highest rate of suicide in America. They, amongst the teenagers, the young children, young children, and oh. um, just, just, just stories that you can't imagine would be happening in America, like a third world country. So for me to be in ground zero of the worst of the worst and to be uh, given, given an opportunity to come into the homes of these women and hear their stories of loss and uh, determination and continued uh, desire to uphold their stories and wisdom and, and language and support the, the youth was um, just, life-changing life-changing because we don't talk about that you know we when we look at the the news we don't really speak about the natives you know they're this sort of almost like a folklore uh, of days gone by but they're still here and they're very powerful and they're what they've gone through and how they've um managed to survive 
the continued, really, the continued genocide of the peoples is just mind blowing. But I know it's because of their prayer. And I know that they are resilient people. So right. the film really speaks about all parts of the, we speak of the history of the, the, the people. And we were fortunate enough to even meet this young girl here, Tat, Tat, um, Tatanka Scarwin Swiftbird. He's so in cute. this photo with her wolf dog. She speaks about her mother's addiction to meth. And so when she was born, she was basically born with that in her bloodstream. And so she has uh, brain issues because of the drugs and the alcohol. So, but she's a survivor of that experience. And the woman who now takes care of her, who's married to Tatanka's father, who's also Lakota, she's a survivor of sex trafficking. So you're like, oh. how do you, <laughs> so I know it's- so I, know, I, hate I hate these stories, they're horrible. And I'm glad that you have so many amazing producers that have oh, yeah. a big so, voice. Well that, well, that was it. I came back, after the two months I came back and I, and I showed them to the people that I knew that could help. Because I'm like, you know, now that I've just shared that with you, it's like, how can I bring other voices, powerful voices to support the voices of these women? And so Julian Lennon jumped in with his White Feather Foundation and uh, donated and continued to support uh, my endeavors and will continue to support when the film actually comes out. And then Eve Ensler, who I created a couple of short films for prior to my shooting Women of the White Buffalo and her organization, One Billion Rising is unbelievable. The work that she does with Susan Celia Swan, I just love these women so, so deeply. You know, Vagina Monologues is what Eve Ensler is famed for. And uh -huh. the, the, the support that she's giving women across the globe to empower them, to have them remember who they are after some awful, awful experiences that they've had to go through. And she just did a film as well, um, which is on Netflix called City of Joy about the mm -hmm. women in Congo. And it just, it's, it's incredible. It's heart wrenching. You know, I had to watch a lot of other people's work to basically know how to present what I was seeing, you know, and bring it uh, to the screen. And then just recently we have um, The Edge from U2. He wow. just saw the film, was blown away, him and his wife, Morley. I'm in such gratitude because I know that they want to support just, it's not just about the money. It's about how can we lend our voices to wake people up? How and can we lend our voices? That's why people should have a voice to, to help people in need. Now I have a few questions from the audience and um, somebody is asking if you visited the wound shoe. Am I um, saying the little wound shoe? I think a wounded knee. I'm not sure, but it says, did Deborah visit the little wound shoe? And then um, somebody I, else. Sorry, wait, I'm going to just, I'm going to say that, I'm going to say the little wound shoe, I, I don't quite know what that is. I was in, I was in uh, Pine Ridge and I was in, on the uh, Rosebud Reservation. They're the two reservations that I, I stayed at and continued to go back to. And, and then I also am getting asked how many people lived in the community and was the makeup, um, of the tribe, men, women, children. Wait, I'm can't wait to say the solo community. And what was the makeup of the tribe, men, women, children? Okay. How many people? Are right. There and what? So in Pine Ridge, the number that I know of, there's around twenty thousand people, Lakota people mm -hmm. that live in in the pine on the Pine Ridge Reservation. The Pine Ridge Reservation is uh, thirty five hundred square miles, and the way that they have them situated is very, very separated. The film talks all about this, so That's you can- I love this little boy, by the way. I love this picture of this Archer. little boy. Archer. Uh, I have another question. Um, well, I can answer that as, as uh, someone's asking if Women in the White Buffalo will be exhibiting in the U.S. again. And yes, we were in the process of traveling that from L.A. to Boston when we had to shut down for COVID. And, and it will be in some other galleries. We're working on that right now because we can't do social distancing. Everything's a little bit on hold, but just keep in touch with us and we'll let you know where the next gallery will be, where she'll be showing. Also, I have a question. Um, why do you choose to use the backdrop that you do? That was really um, something that Edward Curtis, I think that was something that him and looking at uh, Frank Reinhardt's work of how they shot the natives, they, they painted these backdrops. And so I felt that connection to something that felt old world. And at the same time, you know, I very much chose my template 
of color, you know, how I colorized everything. Everything was very much thought through. That's so beautiful. Wanted, so, yeah, so it was, a, it was really as inspired, I think, inspired by the work of Kurt, Curtis and um, Reinhardt. Yeah. So, see, because someone else is saying um, that the color palette is so unbelievably beautiful. And what is it post edit? What what is the post editing process like? Um, I'm going to just say this. I remember when I got home and I saw all the images, and I thought I'd failed miserably. I looked at everything, and I was like, "This is terrible." And I think even you and I, you know, when I was like, "Okay, I'm going to send you all the images," and I'm like, "Or not?" And you're like, "Deborah, just send." Me. I was like, "No, it's not." And I really i did i suffered a moment of like i messed up i didn't get it right and then i started to play with some of the portraits and i again with the influence of um the curtis and reinhardt sort of palette i was like how do i still retain a feeling of now and yet give it a sense of timelessness so it was it was a process but then i definitely lent towards a little bit of desaturation and, and then adding a little bit of sepia tone to the imagery that's kind of what the other question was, was, are you able to describe any emotions felt during the editing and sorting of your images? To, and that's kind of what you were just talking about, right? It was exhausting. So. It was exhausting because I continued to be in contact with everybody on the reservation. And the deeper you go, the more you know. It's, it's it, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to just say that it's, um, I've had to make sure I liked a lot of sage and um and a lot of meditation because it's this is i think when i came back after the first two months i got home and i went oh i'm going to be somewhat responsible for making sure i make the right decisions based on these stories to bring out these stories in the right way and hold everybody in the right way and i'm also holding on to 530 years of genocide in these stories and I think that's when I had my first meltdown <laughs> and I was yeah. very much alone and I just got on with it. And my writing partner, Charlotte Chatton Adler, unbelievable, unbelievable yeah. help, helped me uh, define the stories, what was important to be told and how to tell it. So it was, there was people came into support and continued to because we all want to make a difference. Yeah, and, and everybody else out there, you can still help contribute to this project as well. This is for all of us. Now, um, I'm glad someone spelled something wrong. It's usually me. <laughs> this wasn't me this time. Um, I do know how to spell, but uh, somebody was asking if you've been to the wound school. Do you know what that is? No? Okay, so that's a no. Sorry. sorry. Um, I've not been, clearly, I've not been there, so I'm sorry. Somebody else is asking. By the way, this picture on the screen here right now, I think is just so perfect being that the elections are coming up and that they're, you know, women's right to vote and everyone's right to vote. And I couldn't mm -hmm. say more good things about this photo. I think it's the one of the most powerful in the show. And I love this piece. Um, I, I think it's incredible. And I love that you did the flag. I, I love this. I, mm -hmm. I love, 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 love. And the, so the American someone, flag is upside down, which means distress. Yes. And it, it, the American flag is upside down. The country is upside down. I mean, it's an unfortunate time in our history um, with this everything that's going on. 2020 has been something else. But we don't get political here at Leica, so I'm going to go to the next question. <laughs> but um, <laughs> somebody's asking. This photo isn't political at all. I'm not going to say anything else about it. Don't get me started. But um, uh, somebody's asking how far away the the, the town you were in is from civilization. I think I asked you the same question yesterday when we were doing run through. Yeah, basically you'd look you're looking at 3,500 square miles and these all the little like Allen, Kyle, Pine Ridge Central, then going up to Rosebud, you're talking about an hour, sometimes an hour and a half to get around. Um, so it's really spread out, which was done on purpose by the government when they put these people on this land because these the Lakota are not from South Dakota. So they were placed there and they were placed purposely separate from one another and they don't have public transport. So getting around is really, really difficult. And especially in the dead of winter where a lot of the roads are not cleared except for the main pass-throughs that go from one side of South Dakota to the next, but all the small roads, they don't have, uh, they don't, they're not cleared. So um, it, was an, it was a way of disabling them for sure. So very separated, a lot of driving when, well, when we were making the film, a lot of driving. Yeah. Well, at least you have that nice car. You that uh, you have that groovy Jeep. Now, now, what no, would had, you? I had to make sure we didn't break down. 
and the camper. Deborah has a really cool camper. She's this lady has balls. I I couldn't have slept in that. Thing. Anyways, I, 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 camper, I, yeah. I know, but I'm so you're you're just incredible. I I, I admire you and everything you went through to get this story because it was a labor of love. That's for sure. And and from what I know of people that make documentaries, documentaries are a true labor of love because. It's not some kind of big money making thing. You really have to be passionate about it and want your story to be told at whatever it is. Now we're getting to the end of our talk. So it, what, what would you like um, to have people take away um, with, the, with, what, with your film? And what, it, uh, like, what would you like to leave everybody with? And what is your message about women of the white buffalo? Um, I just feel like the opportunity to share this work really is so that people can be brought what well, let's say what could be brought to their attention is um what it is to be an, a, a a modern day native american indian and how can we support them because i realize that nobody really knows whose land they're really on nobody really knows who their local tribe is and i think that in this moment of labor of love i implore people to just take a look outside of their little bubble and see who is surrounding them in the native tribes the nations and how can you be of support and help to any of them it's it's a very simple act to to support the the people that first welcomed the european settlers to their land well that is beautiful just like you you are beautiful inside and out and i'm so glad that you're doing this and like is so happy and proud to have you a part of our family and um everything uh for uh that you saw today is available on like a gallery la.com if you're interested in purchasing any uh prints or if you need more information about women of the white buffalo you could go to women of the white buffalo um and the I think we're going to have some information showing soon where the where you can get all of that information. Uh, you can get a hold of us at info at likeagallerylla.com. Again, I'm Paris Chong. Um, we have some good things coming up. This is the last. Um, I saved the best for last, actually. This is the last in the series of Leica Conversations for Photoville. We want to thank Leica, and we want to thank Photoville, because this is a, it's such a great platform to get out there and talk about photography and stay connected during these difficult times. Mm -hmm. We still want to tell you a little bit about Deborah. Deborah, can you tell us what where the website is to go to yes. go to find Please her? go to womenofthewhitebuffalo.com. All information on the film is there. Instagram, we have women white buffalo, and also Deborah Anderson Creative, and we have women of the white buffalo on Facebook. So all of that will continue to update you with the news of what is going on with the film and any upcoming coming gallery events as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving me some of your time. And I hope it was insightful and helpful in some way. Um, but thank you. And thank you, Laika. And thank you, Photoville. And thank you, Paris. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And, and Deborah's currently in our six times six show hanging at the Laika Gallery LA right now. So if you're in the, in the city, come and see us. We are social distancing and wearing masks and staying safe. And we encourage all of you to stay safe out there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Six times six show, like a gallery LA, yay. <laughs> Have a beautiful day, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you, love.